Innate helps companies avoid project surprises, make better informed decisions, share knowledge, and deliver better outcomes. Innate, transforming the way the world builds. Hello, project people. Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Project Chatter podcast. It's always good to have you with us. And Dale, we should do a shout out to all the Mo Bros out there. Do you want to do a bit of a piece? Absolutely. Um, I actually got my 10 year badge, even though this is my 13th year, Val. So I don't know if you got yours, but um, absolutely, Movember. It's cold this side of the equator. And I tell you what, shaving off the beard. I definitely, definitely felt it. So, um, but no, look, it's there, there's it's been going on for years. There's still a stigma attached to to men's health, and um, I think the more we can make noise about it, the the better. I think it started off with as a bit of fun for all of us, but um, mm. as we get older, we know it it uh, really affects men of all ages and all creeds. So um, yeah, we need to support. We need to support. Excellent, and we'll share the link to your uh, donation page as well. Um, I didn't do it for 10 years because I only started growing a beer about five, about five years ago. So it's still <laughs> fresh for me. <laughs> uh, but let's, in, let's introduce our guest, uh, Ian Heptonstall. How are you, sir? Thanks for joining us. I'm very well, thanks. Well, hi, Dale. Did you, did you see how I didn't get that wrong? I did it perfectly. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, things are changing. It's looking up for 2023. Um, look, let's get into it. I think, firstly... Um, Alliance contracts, we talked about contracts mm. actually a few times this year. It's, it's becoming a, a common theme of discussion and not necessarily just the, the format of the contract and how it works, but behaviors, collaboration, how we work better, particularly because projects are getting a little bit more complex and complicated, a little bit larger, let's say. Um, and there's definitely a pour of investment. I know it's the same in UK as Australia and, and various other countries. Um, but, but where did it start for you, Ian? How did you get into this? What's, why is it your passion? Um, I have to turn the clock back about 25 years ago to uh, North East England in the back end uh, of the 90s. Um, then I was working in the chemical industry, which is where I learned all about projects, was uh, running projects employed by an owner organisation. Uh, when, when the UK used to have world large, uh, world scale chemical industry. And at the time, I worked in a division that was sort of spanning our own the company that owned us, ICI, and the wider chemical industry. So as ICI was breaking itself up and selling bits off, it had a division that provided uh, specialist engineering and, and project management services to the chemical industry. And I was within that. So I was actually selling a project management service from a company owned by the uh, by the global chemical company ICI and and we got a contract with a client uh, an American company Roman Haas to help upgrade uh, one of their plants up on Tyneside uh, Newcastle in the UK and as part of that project I'd been involved in the in, in the front end and we could have done it what is still fairly conventionally, we'd have done the engineering, we'd have placed some contracts, we'd have managed them traditionally. And, and having come from the owner's mindset, I was in sort of two minds. It was, on the one hand, it was exciting to learn a new skill because I knew you had to be a real bastard to run contracts in the construction sector. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so that was about a, a new thing to learn. But I also had spent 15 years running projects with the mindset of the project owner. And I thought, well, that might add a bit of tension. So when, when I was helping to develop the project execution plan during the uh, front end engineering that we were doing, uh, working with the, uh, the senior manager on the manufacturing side, we'd both heard about uh, an initiative known as CRINE, which were came, which was an initiative run in the North Sea, the oil and gas sector, uh, where they were struggling with the problem of low oil prices that made it uneconomic to get the uh, reserves from the North Sea. 
and, and they developed this industry-wide initiative run by the chemical companies to find ways to build exploration projects that put uh, oil online for 30% less and in half the time. And they were starting to succeed. Uh, so we'd heard about some of these. And one aspect was this thing that they were calling Project Alliance Contracting. We thought, hey, that sounds interesting. Let's give it a go. And that's about how much knowledge we had at the time, by the way. Um, and, and coming back to the point you made earlier on, Val, about the pressures from much, much larger, much more complex, complicated projects, sort of encouraging people to think collaboration and alliancing. This was at the other end of the scale. This was not a massive project. In today's money, it was probably 20, 30, 40, uh, million US dollars. You know, as construction projects go, that's not massive. Uh, but it was important to the client. It was it was not a greenfield project. They had an operating manufacturing plant that they needed to shut down, change a load of bits to it, and bring it back online, making the same product in a different way, but within a short period of time so that the customers didn't notice that uh, there was no uh, manufacturing capability. So it was high risk to the client. Uh, so the more we thought about it, the more we thought, well, that sounds interesting. So we gave it a go. But, you know, I've just been reminded about the, the procurement approach we took. Let, let me do a quick test. So this is this is a the total project, call it $30 million. So the construction activity is going to be 10, 12 million US dollars ish. If you include buying all the equipment, we'll call it $20 million. Uh, how long would it normally take to select a construction contractor from the start, from when you first go out to market to getting them working on the project? Give me, come on, Dale and Val, give me a quick guess. Well, I'm talking from my experience, but over a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say about. 18 yeah. months, maybe? Yeah. A week, we took four weeks. Oh, wow. Uh, oh, wow. We, and we went through three stages there, by the way. We, we, had, we had eight companies we'd identified that might be interested. And, well, actually, we got eight submiss written submissions in, uh, expressing an interest, giving us enough information for us to shortlist five of them to have uh 90 minute meetings with and of those five we shortlisted two that we spent basically a day with we wanted to visit two client sites see how the projects work uh one of the visits we did uh dale you may uh you, you probably don't remember but you will probably have traveled on the heathrow express yep that was one of the projects that one of the uh uh actually the unsuccessful subcontractor uh, proposed to us. And all that happened within four weeks. And we could do that because the selection process, the main criteria were competence and capability, both in this domain and not so much experience of working on project alliances, but that helped, but enough understanding and a genuine willingness to work in this way uh, and actually, during the selection process, we we didn't know exactly what the collaborative contract would look like. So part of the uh, information we were looking for during the 90 minute uh, presentations, the, the middle stage, was your ideas on the best way to contract. So we both learned some useful information. We weren't we didn't give leading questions to the bidders. They had open questions, so they needed to convince us. But also, it showed their understanding of the idea, which is quite a useful technique during procurement, uh, is, is to offer the open question. Those who think procurement should be, you know, tick boxes, right or wrong, don't like that sort of question. They're like closed questions that they can tick and add up the number of ticks in a spreadsheet. But mm -hmm. my view, the, the real world isn't like that. It, it, it involves assessing 
an organization's capability. So asking certain open questions. Uh, the other the other one that we asked at the time was knowing this sort of project so we didn't give a full spec we said look it's it's roughly 30 million us dollars it's roughly going to take this amount of time it's going to be in that particular plant there's a you know 80% of the work will be done under uh, operating plant safety rules and if you know the industry you know what that means if you don't know the industry, then we don't want you to come and work on the project. So we gave enough of a briefing in about three pages. And then we said, with what you know, tell us what you think the major risks are going to be um, on a project of that type. Now, we didn't want it as a risk register because we developed that once we got the selection company on board. We wanted it as a way of seeing, did they know what the hell they were talking about running construction on a working chemical factory? And uh, so that, that's how we managed to do it in a short period of time. Because we were asking for your competence and willingness to work in this way, that doesn't take a lot of time and effort. We didn't want to fix price lump sum bid. We said, We've already got the estimate, providing you sign up to it under the alliance arrangements, to some extent, it doesn't matter what it costs. You, at the due diligence stage with the company we selected, of course, they went through the estimate and they went through the, uh, the schedule as it was, you know, to give themselves confidence that the target was yeah, good enough because that's another difference with alliances and non-alliance contracts is that once they've got a cost target, it's a, co it's a target. It is not a hard commitment that you'll be hung out to dry with if you miss. And, and we all know, I've got no problem going for a stretch target. I've got no problem trying to walk a tightrope so long as I've got a safety net. But if you get rid of the safety net, if you make my stretch target something that, you know, my career and my income and my mortgage depends upon, I'm going to put orders of magnitude more effort into it. And that, that's one of the reasons that, that certainly my version of project alliancing and IPD should be a much faster process to get people on board in. But anyway, I've diverged. We we had this project ah, and it was fixed ah, seven. Fantastic. We, we sort of learned as we went along. Uh, as, as I said, I probably had an advantage coming from a background of managing projects with the owner's mindset. That meant I, I understood the whole project life cycle from, from clarifying the need, the front end, the, the early development stages, when it's the right time to go into execution. Um, and we, we selected the construction partner, not as is often conventionally, you know, three days before you want the piled, the, the piling contractor on site to start digging stuff to make it look like it was happening. No, they were on board much more, much earlier than that, towards the end of the, uh, the front end development. And certainly in terms of the execution planning and working out the organization and designing things like the, the site safety program, all those things were not yet given. So um, that, that's how we managed it, to do it in four weeks. When they got the RFP, it basically said, we want your submissions by then. These, Please hold these two dates, because if you're successful, we'll ask you in for 90 minutes. And then the week after, please hold these two dates, because if you're in the last round, we will want to come and see some of your clients and, and meet your directors so they had about a month's notice right from the beginning pencil these dates in so yeah the the evening after we had the final one of those sort of middle round 90 minute discussions uh, we didn't go home until we'd done the assessment scoring of the capability against the selection criteria and first thing next morning i could tell the two we'd selected and the three that we hadn't so that's uh, we we didn't we didn't feel we were being cavalier and cutting corners, but it was 
you know, for, for me, it was it was great and a breath of fresh air to see you know, my client, the project owner, got it and was more than happy to, uh, yep, that makes perfect sense. Let's get on and do it. And the, mm. the we, we we ended up with uh, uh, a, a particular payment mechanism, which uh, I've still see I've seen variations on the theme that do the same thing with different language, but it would still be my go to approach if if I was still uh, uh, in the uh, yeah, running projects or running project procurement. Yeah, I would still use that method. Mm. which we we developed and designed in collaboration in 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 effect the the contract was not put together by the specialists who like to do contracts in fact we did it the other way around so when when we had the uh, when when we selected the construction partner so in effect there were there were three parties to this alliance the Roman Haas is the owner, the company I worked for, and we did the, the engineering, the design, and we bought all the main bits of equipment. The construction partner uh, did construction management and used their own resources for mechanical uh, pipe work and uh, electrical and, sub and managed the subcontracts for the other uh scaffolding civils painting lagging etc so they they acted as a manager plus some direct labor so it was only a three-party contract once we'd agreed the uh, the deal and signed up for it we um well not signed up for it but just agreed then we knew we had a contract to put in place so the the contractor would start people working on the job. The client would just reimburse them at some nominal daily rate, uh, like we and our team were. And then we, um, one of the things we did was we had a facilitated leadership team meeting where the two of us who were the, 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 the lead managers for the, the two supply partners went along. And there was about three of the key um, managers from the client. So it's about four or five people were going to be the leadership team of this project. And, and, and we went through a sort of structured team building, understanding of each organization. And at the same time, we started to talk about how the contract would work. So this was sort of generalists, no specialists, flip charts. What do we want to happen? Uh, yeah. The, we knew we would have a variable uh, fee arrangement that was aligned to the client, the project owner's objectives for the project. But so they had some initial idea, then we'd talk about, well, what should those be? And we, we ended up with five different criteria because uh, they want the, there were two time-based performance measures one was the duration of the plant stoppage when there would be no production. And the other one was when that stoppage would happen. So when the project would be finished was one date, the duration of the outage was another, uh, the total cost that we spent was a third, uh, the safety performance of the project was actually the largest uh, financial variable performance measure. And the smallest fifth one, which was actually 10% of our variable income, was what we call the entering into the spirit of things measure. The, the, the client would assess whether the project team members, now this was not only the employees of the alliance companies, so it was anyone working on the project, did they seem to work as they were employed by us? That was, that, that was in effect the wording that we agreed on the principle. And in this two day workshop, we worked out how it would be measured and, and developed the word models to say, well, this, this is business as usual. So if you perform to that level, 
you'll get a, a nominal amount of profit that you might expect to do on a normal job. If it looks like this, you'll get nothing. And if it looks like this, you'll get twice that nominal amount. So for each of those five measures, we agreed where those targets were. So for the, um, so my variable fee coming into my company was in five independent chunks to do with the cost, those two time ones, safety and behaviors. And, and being an alliance, the measures were not on how our company does their bit. The measures were on how the whole project team performs. So it didn't matter who did what. Just, just like you know, that's the that's the underlying principle. So, and as soon as we'd signed up to that, it removed all of that tug of war, the hassle you can sometimes get between uh, different suppliers and subcontractors who who behave very nicely to each other, but when they're not in the same room, they're 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 scheming and working out how they where the nearest loophole is and. Uh, you, you, you'll know the uh, the stuff that goes on as better than I will. You'll be more up to date, but I'm sure that still happens. We we remove that. <clears throat> what one one of one of the examples that I can still remember that shows how the alliance contract we had in place really helped decisions to be made quickly <clears throat> was the previous large project that they had on this site spent about. And this was uh, this was back in the nineties. Remember, on not a massive project, it spent nearly a hundred thousand pounds on variations for tradespeople to drink tea and read the newspapers in the morning. Uh, because if you've ever worked on an operating uh, factory under permit to work schemes, you turn up, you go to the place that you pick up the permits to work. If they're signed, you can then go off and get the work. If they've not been signed, you have to wait for them to come. And th there was this sort of internal politics between the, the projects team and the plant operators who were always far too busy with more important fires to fight. So very often the permits were not available first thing in the morning. And if you didn't have to wait, say, half an hour or an hour for them, then you went back to the cabins to drink tea and read the newspaper and then you came back at 10 30 to see if the permits were there and of course the contracts had no motivation to do anything about that so that was one of the big worries from the owner now we had in the project estimate we had some contingency for the against that very risk we had an amount of money for for tea drinking variations and but that was part of the the contingency pot that was managed by the alliance. So basically, we knew if if we didn't need to spend the contingency, then yeah, the client would get most of the value of that, and we, as the suppliers, would get a fair chunk of it. So we didn't want to spend contingency. Uh, so so we had a chat, and the it was originally allocated to paying variations for subcontractors and for extra time which is a construction work package. We had a chat and we said, well, maybe I can get one of our qualified chemical engineers to come in at four in the morning and do the legwork for, uh, for the plant operating supervisors. Yeah, they weren't gonna be given permission to do the signing, but they could do the legwork, they could get to know, they could build a relationship with the operators and Within 15 minutes, Trevor said, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's give it a go. No paperwork, no variations. Yeah, we, we shuffled some money around on a spreadsheet because we were we were keeping track of our commitments and costs. But that was all. We just moved moved numbers around a spreadsheet. It, it wasn't a change from the point of view of uh, what the physical asset looked like. So we didn't need to document it as a change because we weren't uh, we didn't have to go through safety checks and uh, communication to people. Quick decision, got a, a well overqualified chemical engineer in, 
he worked, uh, yeah, he spent about four months getting up at four in the morning, getting the paperwork ready. Uh, and then later on, we we used him as part of the commissioning and startup team. Um, now mm. he'd got to know the project. But think about that sort of change. There were dozens and dozens of those decisions just made on the what's the right thing to do. I can... I can still picture the bureaucracy and paperwork you'd need to do if you if you contracted that conventionally. It's, Absolutely. It's crazy. Um, I, was, I was going to ask you a question about that, and thank you for, for going into detail. I think that's <laughs> given us a good baseline for for this alliance contracting. Um, from a contracting method, I mean, you've seen different contract types. Hmm. Clearly, you think alliance contracts are the best, or are they the best, or is it depending on the type of context? It would it, it would be my default start position. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if 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 I was spending two hundred thousand pounds on something that was being built at a factory, no problem. But if in today's monies I had a a project that different parties influenced, and the major risk were how these parties came together and integrated, uh, it would be my default from you know a few million quids worth of project. I would that's where I'd start. Uh, yeah. I don't see why I would use another unless a senior influential person uh, to my career overrode it or would get upset if I did it. Uh, so yeah, there are pragmatic yeah, yeah. career career management reasons for doing it, but I can't I can't quite see any any logical reason. So I hear I hear thing. Well, I suppose one of them might be that. Because it involves different practices, uh, there might be quite a bit of a learning curve for for teams and people who uh, yeah, have just developed different habits. Uh, so mm -hmm. so when i when I read case studies about large project alliances that invest very significantly, in things like collaborative teamwork, facilitation, and, and stuff like that. I think, well, that's important, but isn't that a learning, a learning cost rather than an ongoing cost? And, and the reason I think that is because projects are complex things. I would hope that any project would invest in facilitation of cross-functional working to get the project done. So I, I don't see that as a premium that only alliances should do, because all projects need to think through what's the best yeah, execution strategy, who should have which role and responsibility, how are we going to manage data and knowledge and approvals and all that stuff. And uh, uh, you, you have your, your, your true value engineering facilitation meetings and the facilitation of risk register generation. So. That needs collaboration, but to me, that should be something all projects do anyway. So it shouldn't be a premium for alliances. So I suppose, I suppose if the behavioural facilitation learning curve costs well outweigh the benefits on a one-off project that a project owner only does one project every 20 years, that that might be an issue. But mm. even, even then, I'm sure they could get competent uh, motivated suppliers because that's that's all we were we learned it as we went along and it was a pretty damn good project but i yeah. can see if you've got the wrong people that the the wrong people with different experiences it would be harder but but yeah i would i would use it all the time we have um i mean i think in australia at least alliances and ppps you know public private partnerships are very very popular what we do see less of though is like the nec contract arrangement, uh, which obviously is very big in the UK. Uh, how does it stack up against that? And I think the challenges I'm seeing is that maybe alliances at scale have a bit of a challenge, especially if they don't have that collaborative piece, which I'm sure we'll get into in a second. Mm. Um, what about the NEC approach? Is that something you've experienced? Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've not used it as a project manager, but I, I've been involved in many projects one step removed that have used NEC and I know a bit about it uh, I, I I always found it one of those things that if you if you know about 
procurement and contracts, but not necessarily in construction, takes a hell of a long while to get your mind around it. Mm. it. It seems one of those things that is is written very much in the language of the construction sector, uh, maybe deliberately to keep people like me out, or maybe just because that's the language that's used. Now, the, my sweeping generalization is when NEC was introduced in the construction and infrastructure sector, it was a, a step or two in the right direction from extremely adversarial, selfish contracts towards collaboration. But I never saw it as a truly collaborative contract uh, as, a, as a project alliance would be. Now, having said that, as you, I think you were discussing uh, a couple of episodes ago, the NEC4 has introduced an alliance form of contract. Uh, mm. I, I would, I would love to have a look at it. I did some quite. I saw the consultation version, and I sent pages and pages of comments and feedback, uh, but I've no idea whether they got binned or taken account of, because. Mm. I, I just balked at paying 200 quid just to have a look and see what it looked like. Uh, where, whereas actually I can read the Australian government uh, standard form for project alliance in contracting without paying a penny. I can, I can look at the, uh, the couple of American forms of contract for IPD from the American Institute of Architects and consensus docs as a non-user without using them, I can look at them with the watermarks and see what's in them without paying, but I can't do that with the NEC. So I sort of, I, I had a slop and refused. I said, I'm not doing that. And, and, and even, even now I'm not, uh, I, I feel, well, I'm not going to add it to our university reading list for our students, just uh, just almost out of spite. It, I would love to feel it's, it's taken on board the key principles. Uh, but if you use the the more common uh, um, form of NEC, I, I, there's many things that it doesn't do out of the box that I would see as collaborative. Um, and I might be out of date, uh, and no doubt I'll uh, I'll um, if if anyone who knows NEC and who knows me realizes that I'm too out of date, please drop me a note and, uh, and correct <laughs> my errors. But, but it, it used to be firstly that NEC, uh, any, any variable payment was linked to cost savings. And, and unless you change the standard, if the project didn't save any money, there was no standard mechanism for rewarding excellent behavior. Now, so if you complete a hotel three months early, uh, fantastic quality that's never been seen before, et cetera, et cetera. So the client's delighted, but it comes in on budget. No standard mechanism for, for rewarding those excesses. So uh, I know you can sort of get round it, but I think, well, why would you even allow that in something you're saying is collaborative if the only way to to have so-called gain share is if you save some money. That mm. seems to motivate over-egging the estimates and quotations. Because uh, if I if I come in honest, if I, if I set a stretch target and I achieve that stretch target uh, and, a, and exceed a load of other performance targets, well, I'm afraid there's nothing in the bonus pot. So yeah. a step in the right direction, but I, yeah, with my broader procurement experience, I don't see it as truly collaborative, like uh, like many of the uh, best alliances are. But then, because yeah. stand, standard forms of contracts then get political. So men, many of them, uh, which I assume is to get the whole thing out of some committee because somebody's vetoing it. That's, that's what I'm picturing. So you, you have mechanisms where you have the option to reward in the way that I described, you know, a collective pot that the whole pot gets bigger or smaller. So the different participants percentages go up or together in harmony. But there's also a mechanism that I think in Australia, it's reserved to the engineering and designing partners in Alliance, 
that you can still pay a cost per unit of time for a resource that has overhead built into it. So if a, if a designer thinks, hmm, it would be better for the project if we did less design and the steelwork contractor did the final detailed design, that would hit the bottom line in financial in dollars or pounds of the engineering company. So it adds it adds some tension about do I do what helps my company be financially successful or do I do what's in the best interest of the client? And, and I don't see why you would want to build those in if you had a choice. But as I understand it from people involved, it was one of those sort of political decisions because whoever was representing the engineering uh, consulting industry said, no, no, we always do that. We always have markup in our rates. We've got to keep doing that. Uh, we can't move away from it. Of course you can. We yeah, did quite easily. We had, yeah, uh, we, exactly. So, uh, so yeah, and NEC the the alliance form might be might be fantastic. Uh, I, I don't actually know. I, the consultation draft had some things in that concerned me, mm. and then you, you've you've got to learn to speak NEC ish. Yeah, it is a language. Um, it is an art form. But uh, we would love to hook you up with um, someone who does know, uh, and he is based in the UK. Glenn Hyde. I don't know if you know him personally, but. Um, He's been on the podcast a few times. He's definitely got his head around NEC language. Um, definitely one of the best translators I've met. What about you, Dale? I think he's um, he's got the gift. Um, but uh, look, I'll get Dale in because I know we've we've gone through a few questions, but I know he's got some queries for you. Sure. <laughs> I, I think it'll probably make a good debate there, actually. Um, mm. Yeah. And we're always up for debates on the podcast, so I know you're up for a debate as well, Ian. Oh, uh, definitely. Yeah. You, threw, you threw some good questions at the EVA uh, presenters there um, from memory. But just coming back to it, while you while you were chatting there, I was thinking a lot around your procurement experience and the various types of contracts that we all know are out there in the ether. And it feels like in value, this is, I guess, a nod to your whole discussion around you know, making decisions on projects. And it's almost bring it back to those upfront decisions, right? And I guess the question that I formulated in my head was, regardless of the type of contract we enter into or the type of procurement methodology, or as they call it, delivery methodology, whatever you want to call Don't it. Get me started. Right? I know, I know. <laughs> um, whatever you want to call it, right? Whatever yeah. structure you have in place, it's incredibly important that you have the right selection process in place. As you said, right, capability and competency. Now, if you're marking against the wrong things, then you got the wrong suppliers in the supply chain, regardless of the contractual nature that you've got set up. And so are organizations equipped well enough to assess who they're actually allowing to supply them on these mega complex projects that last for years and years? Um, because I feel like that is a quagmire and it's really, really difficult to tell who's really good and who's not. Because let's face it, right? No one's going to blink an eyelid if you bring one of the top four in and you spend hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds. But you could get an SME that is really shit hot at what they do, right? That's far less. Yeah. If they make one small mistake, oh, you made a really bad decision. But oh, you yeah. spent those hundreds and hundreds and thousands of pounds mm. on one of the big names, and it's okay because it's one of the big names. And and the, the, there's an awful lot in that uh, CYA dis uh, decision making, uh, and there is safety in crowds. You know, even if the big four make a total hash of it, oh, I went to the best in the industry. What else could I have done? And, and yes. But but if if somebody tries something you know small and different, there is that risk. And and I'm aware that I was extremely lucky to be in the right sort of environment that gave me loads of freedom to make those decisions. And and of course I kept my bosses aware of what we were doing and and, and made sure that they had a degree of skin in the game as well. Uh, but I'm sure they'd have forgotten that had things gone pear shaped. Uh, but. Yeah, that, that 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 is that is a big dilemma, I think, Dale. Is um, 
<clears throat> the sort of safety in numbers. It, in terms of you know, the, the first part of your question about you know, the risk of choosing the wrong people, mm -hmm. uh, and and that's that's very important on something like a uh, a contract. Uh, one of the one one of the uh, thinking tools or simple models within procurement is that choosing a procurement strategy should take account of not only the relative amount of money you're spending, but the supply related risk you're taking. Uh, I always call this the short and curlies factor. That you know the the more pain you would suffer if you got it wrong, the that 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 is the dimension. Yep. If you could throw money at a problem, that's easy. But you know, even if you had loads of money to untangle yourself, say from a uh, an engineering consultant or a construction contract, it would be painful uh, and quite difficult. So those are high risk selections as well as high value. And you know, even out of the procurement textbooks, that says collaboration and intimacy is likely to give you the best deals. Market competition for high value uh, purchases relies on it being low market risk. You know, if you're if, if you're buying uh, you know, oil tanker capacity on the open market, you know, you can you can make decisions within days and weeks and, and one oil tanker is like another. Or, you know, if you're buying uh, Back in the old days, it used to be coal, but that's frowned upon for buying coal now, but not to Australia because it's a key part of your economy. You know, if, you, if you're buying commodities like that, it's sort of, you know, come on down, Venezuela. Oh, your price has gone up. Oh, let's go to the North Sea. You can chop and change. And that's the sort of segment that market competition is definitely a very sensible first approach. Big value construction work where you need intimacy and integration. It's different. Mm. You, you, you want a degree of collaboration. And uh, that doesn't need to be multi-project. Yeah, a single project is big enough to get collaboration going. Even that little one of mine, ours. Yeah, the companies involved never worked again, but we had an extremely collaborative team. Yeah, you, you know within a few weeks if it's going to work. It's like mm. personal relationships. I'd, I'd, you know, you don't have to have four marriages to actually get the idea of being married right. You, you can get it right first time, you know. You don't have to keep trying. And 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 I think, yeah, I think you asked Dale, have we have we got enough of the skills to make those decisions? Now, I would say yes, because all those companies recruit people. And if you think about it, recruiting our employees is exactly the same risk. Mm -hmm. You know, are they going to be any good? Are they going to, yeah, particularly in a, if, the, if it's a reasonably senior position, you know, are they going to break the company? Uh, are they going to harm? How are they going to get on with everybody else? You know, use, use the knowledge we've got of recruitment in, uh, in procurement. That for me, that's the sort of knowledge that you need. Does this person seem good enough? But th think how disastrous companies would be if they use the methods of con uh, construction procurement to recruit <laughs> chief execs or the next CFO. <clears throat> you know, get to do particularly if it's this two stage technical compliant and then then commercial. So you get you get people to submit their CVs and then you you rate the CVs at arm's length. You don't you often don't need to talk to them because you can get all the information from the detailed CV and the uh, uh, the pre recruitment questionnaire that you've sent them. And then you put the answers into a spreadsheet and you drop out those who uh, who, who don't meet the must have criteria. And of the rest, you select the one who will work for the lowest salary. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Yeah, and it's even quicker now with technology, right? You just have uh, look for key, see, you, you search for keywords, right, and yeah. pull those out, and the lowest salary wins. Now, I I I appreciate um, <laughs> the analogy you're giving there, mm -hmm. and so I think you're saying yes, the skill exists, but we haven't applied it correctly when we procure for major projects, and no. therefore we we don't necessarily have um, the right approach. 
in organizations today. And then it brings me back to my thought around alliance contracts. And in my experience, and you might tell me it's different, Ian, um, I don't think it's broadly or widely used in the UK um, because yeah. in my experience, it's mainly been NEC type contracts, you know, engineering type contracts. I know having spoken with Val before, it is far more widely used in Australia. So not such a, mm. a, a big thing in Oz. Um, why, why isn't it more broadly used in the UK? Um, well, part of me says, I just can't understand it. But then I, I think that uh, there's, there's a couple of things that conspire against it. I think m much of the infrastructure part of construction is driven by public sector spending. And, and there, I think there's, there's almost a political pressure that says, you know, if you can't put some numbers in a spreadsheet to prove value, then it doesn't exist. Uh, you know, professionals making a judgment that you can put some numbers against, but it's still a judgment, is seen as, you know, mm. bad, open to corruption, open to fraud. But the thing is, it's a fact of life. Just pretending that something that's inherently complex can be made complicated. I think you had Dave Snowden on a short while ago, didn't you? Yeah, we've had him on Talking about uh, right. uh, But yeah, that... Uh, and. And I'm not going to talk as eloquently as a Dave, and I don't understand most of the words he uses, but that's my slow <laughs> break. You but, and me both, yeah. <laughs> but, but the idea of complex and complicated systems, you know, complicated systems have got a right answer, uh, given enough computer power and time. Yeah, you know, an expert can calculate it. Complex systems are changing all the time, and the interactions. And if you make a decision on Friday, you you might make a different decision with the same people next Wednesday because either things have changed or the people have changed. And, and those things that are based on the interaction and serendipity and an and emergence mean it's unknowable. And I think mm. yeah, the public sector and actually a number of the initiatives around improving uh, projects and construction are struggling because they're not embracing the inherent nature of, of complexity, which means we don't know. We've got to test and try something out. And that, that for me is a mindset on selection. You know, we think these are the best people. When we first did that project alliance, uh, before the construction partner came on board, we still had plan B we could fall back on. We, we managed the timing of our selection process so that if it went totally wrong, we could still fall back on the more conventional contracting with lots of little subcontractors and we would manage it on site approach. So we, we had that fallback. And if you manage those key decisions on a project like that, you can give it a go. A, go a good alliance project will have easy divorce protocols. You know, and if, if, if one part, party walks away, the rest of the alliance works out how to fill the gap. You know, we can take bits on, we can get somebody else in. Uh, and that that's a nature of most complex systems, like in biology. You know, you chop an arm off, you, you chop a, a, a branch off a tree and the tree grows around it. Uh, yeah. But but if you if you whip out a gearbox from the car, the car's stumped, the car can't fix itself. But a complex system like a project team. Uh, is is more like a biological living entity that it can fix itself, and and I think what's key is to get the right conditions in place to start with, plant some seeds and see how they go, and if if a few weeks in you see you've planted a weed or some Himalayan balsam, you whip it out and get rid of it, and and again that's a different approach to contracting, because if it's taken you eighteen months to choose somebody. One, you don't want to change your mind because it's embarrassing because you've spent all that money. Uh, and and you, may, you, may, you may not have had time because you've wasted all the time doing a, a pseudo thorough selection assessment where you've put two decimal places on a feeling that should be on a scale of one to five, um, which, uh, which seems to be much 
much of what uh, what calls itself procurement now is uh, uh, expensive young bright MBA graduates from a consultant filling in lots of pages of spreadsheets to justify a decision that's already been made. Well, it's from the big four, so it's okay, right? Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, just a quick comment there. Oh, um, and the framework agreement, so that's that, that's even better. Exactly. Frameworks are amazing. They always deliver the best value. Um, <laughs> yeah, just a few comments, Ian, before I jump back to Val. Um, yeah, so first off, I think Gary Lloyd and Joe Lucas would love your analogies there with, you know, talking about how perhaps we're rewilding, planting weeds, taking them out and, you know, all that jazz and regrowing. Yeah. There, there was a, um, or there, you know, we just recently recorded a, a re an impromptu podcast with Colin D. Ellis. And on there, I spoke to him about cantons, uh, you know, from Switzerland mm -hmm. and how perhaps we could use cantons, that sort of thinking in projects. But I won't spoil that for the listeners that's coming out. So there's one to ponder on as well. But I'm quite interested in, you know, this idea where, you know, it doesn't have to be a long, cumbersome process. And it's almost like a, perhaps it's a try before you buy mechanism to sort of simplify it in my, for, for my simple mind, at least. So it's quite interesting, mm. different strategies or tactics you could employ um, when procuring. And I think you're right. It's, it's, the, it's out there. The information's out there. Mm. You've got people like yourself willing to share the experiences as well and the knowledge. But yet we don't go and seek for these alternative views, I think. I know, Val, what do you think? Mm. Now I'm with you. I think as well the uh, well look we, we've been told that we're not doing much better in the project space. So regardless of contract type, it's not the contract that keeps the project on time and on budget. And I think we we both know that uh, what well, we've been projects where we've seen people, excellent people, um, pull out heroic efforts and execute projects to the point where uh, you know if it wasn't for them, there wouldn't be a project. And it it kind of rests on the shoulder of the few rather than the mass. Uh, so I kind of consider projects. I love these analogies that we're talking about, like a flow of water would be my view of how projects work because it's very hard to stop once we kick off a project. And so we do, and I go back to Simon White, Ian, who him and I share a, a fascination around the theory of constraints and you know what water does. If there is a blockage, it goes around it very similar to your tree analogy and um, if you've got the right dynamic of people, they'll they'll kind of hold each other together in a critical type link. And I guess that that was my mm. cue to kind of bring in this kind of language around critical chain, because I think critical chain and value chains in particular around projects and how they work uh, is a very interesting subject. So maybe we can give a baseline of what, what do you mean by critical chain and then we'll go into the detail. Uh, Critical chain is a methodology for scheduling and controlling progress of the work involved in a project. So it's it's an alternative approach to a critical path schedule and using milestones or earned value to see where you're up to and decide what to do about it during execution. Uh, so it's about the work of a project. Just like just like a schedule, so it operates in that space. So even, even though for a long while it was called critical chain project management (CCPM), I've started just calling it critical chain because to me project management is a much broader uh, concept. You know about a need, an opportunity, benefits, options, alternatives, deciding the scope, investigating. Yeah, critical chain is about. It's a tool for execution. Once you've decided to do something and you want to do it as reliably and quickly as possible, so you're striving for on time in less time, on budget at lower cost uh, and without compromise, then just like a project alliance, it for me, it's, it's the default option if you're using a, an out of the box methodology. So yeah, critical chain, the methodology that was kicked off with one of Goldratt's books was mentioned, uh, Theory of Constraints, TOC. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, Goldratt was commissioned to develop a methodology for managing projects by the Norwegian oil and gas company Statoil. Uh, some, of their, some of their managers had read Goldratt's first book, The Goal, which is the... Uh, the the novel form business business story about somebody who turned around a manufacturing 
plant and it introduces in story form some of the basic methods of using the TOC method for managing a production facility. And, and Statoil contacted him and said, we like those ideas, we've got similar projects, but we don't make widgets in volume, we make oil rigs. Come and, come and, come and translate those ideas to the world of oil and gas. So, and, and the, the way Goldrack told the story, he didn't, re he didn't really have an idea of what to do because he didn't know about engineering projects and EPC and all that stuff. Uh, but but he went along and sort of started to have an inkling. And like most good consultants, he was about you know a day ahead of the the client. So so that, then he had a uh, as part of his network, they started to develop the methodology. Uh, they not just with Statoil, they were working with a series of other projects. Uh, one of whom, by the way, uh, I don't know whether Balfour Beatty as a brand travels, but in the UK, uh, Balfour Beatty uh, was was one of those pilot uh, environments where they they didn't just test the method; they helped to develop it. Uh, in in the UK, I've spoken to some of the people who were involved in there. So the method was piloted and developed. And then Goldrack wrote the book, I think, published in 1997. Uh, and then since then, others have picked the method up. It's been used hundreds and thousands of times, just like Project Alliancing. Uh, some of the most successful projects in the world use it as a methodology. But you pick up any of the big bodies of knowledge to get a, uh, a tick in the box project management qualification from one of the big professional bodies. And it hardly mentions it despite despite some of the massive projects that have used it and uh yeah, have said it's been instrumental in delivering strategic benefits i i, I remember um at, attending a conference in just outside washington 2014 15 something like that about seven or eight years ago and uh, and it was related to TOC, theory of constraints, of which this critical chain is part of that body of knowledge. It's the TOC method for uh, managing the execution of projects. And they had the chairman of Mazda flew over to present to the conference. Uh, and and I, I, I Googled him just to make sure it really was the chairman of the board and the chief executive officer, whatever they call them, of Mazda motor cars. And, uh, and, and he presented and said, these methodologies help save our company. And, and because the, the, the way I understand the story, in the early uh, decade of the 21st century, Mazda was under serious pressure. Uh, it was sort of being sold by different companies. I think Ford owned them and then got rid of them and somebody else. So it, it, it wasn't making any money. It was smaller than its Japanese competitors. But then the world was changing the environmental emission standards for motor cars. So there was a heavy demand for drivetrain engineers. So they all, shit. Yeah, we've got we've got these big stretch targets for development and we've got we've got problems getting hold of engineers. So and we're much smaller anyway. And, and and they started to play with experiment with then they use critical chain across their R&D team of 400 to help develop the the new drivetrain technologies that they branded Sky Active. Uh, and, and they were saying things like our development projects, the same people with the same leadership skills and the same supervision were delivering slightly more challenging projects in about half the time with half the resources. I thought you can see how that has a, an enormous impact on organizations like that in, in new product mm -hmm. development. And then they said, after that, we started to look, use it to launch new models as well. Uh, ve ve very impressive. But, uh, you yeah, know, it's it, 
it's hardly known. Now, I think yeah. what, what one of the reasons I sort of uh, suggested we might talk about these two things, because I think they go together very well. The, the idea of a team collaborating, uh, for me, the, the importance of the contracting stuff, I think, as you said, Val, you know, the great project leaders can get stuff done, no matter what the systems and methods and everything else. But that doesn't mean those aren't important, particularly if you want we average Joe's one of the mill project managers to perform reasonably well. You know, it, excellent project managers who really get it intuitively are few and far between. They take a long time to grow and develop and they're bloody expensive. So if, if you, you know, if you're worrying about something like how is the world going to do the extra five trillion dollars worth of net zero projects over the next 30 years? Then you're thinking, mm, OK, so I will grow some fantastic project leaders. That, that's not going to cut it. So you, you, why not? Why not try all sorts of things? Because that that's what struck me with. When I talk to more and more people who, who use critical chain on their projects, that there's this sort of symbiosis if you just look at it as a scheduling method there's a, it's got a lot going for it and there's bits that make sense but as we know the scheduling method by itself is just part of the picture and and good people and good teams can overcome a crap uh schedule plan project control method they just ignore it uh and work around it but if you can get that helping you, that's that that's where there's some some great synergies. So if you've got a team that wants to collaborate, that's chosen quickly and early and has, therefore has got the time to be creative and to think about things. Uh, for me, the the collaborative contracts, uh, you know, picking up the analogy, yes, you can overcome it, but trying to run a project with a non-collaborative contract is like trying to drive a car quickly with a brake on. That, yes, you can do it, but you're going to use more fuel, more energy, and the handling isn't going to be perfect. Why don't you just take the brake off? And then more of us can drive better. <clears throat> so, yeah, that, okay. that's where I see contracting. But then methods like critical chain sort of themselves help the project to go better. But the, the mini mechanism sort of reinforce this idea of collaboration. So they both, they require a collaborative environment to work, which is one of the reasons I think Critical Chain has had a hard time in construction because there isn't a collaborative environment. So that inhibits it. But, but when it's used well, it actually acts as a reinforcer to, to get people into those more collaborative habits through, mm. through a series of mechanisms. And when, when I've talked to uh, project teams who've used critical chain, they say, yeah, 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 it gave us the early warnings. We, we had more time to fix problems. But actually, the things that they did that helped the project go better were not just keeping to schedule. It, it triggered them to look into a problem. And then the humans became creative about solving that problem. And that's what helped the project to flow. So when you look at it, you see, OK, right. So what was helped was that you actually developed this this tool and this method for for doing that bit of work that went faster. You think, yeah, but that wasn't a scheduling method. No, but the scheduling method drew our attention to the problem area in enough time. And the fact that we got a collaborative team. Helped everybody get together and solve that problem on paper so it never was a problem in real life does that make sense you've got you've got yeah, this sort of, yeah. uh, sort of um you can work without one but if you've got the two going together i think it it, it can really help a, a a team sing in in big projects well absolutely and just just from our perspective i mean dale and i've worked on some projects and we found that as um i guess from a scheduling perspective the resource the finite amount of resources to do critical work was a key part of defining whether or not it was reasonable or realistic. 
And so we would use that as a practical measure to check every other metric like critical path, like earn value. And if we had the resource element there, we could argue that, well, if all the three didn't align into some reasonable threshold, there was something not right about it. And right. it would allow you to drill down. Now, obviously, management didn't want to hear this because we weren't in a collaborative environment at the time. Um, and the mm -hmm. client was in a commercial discussion with us. But I think with, yeah. with projects going forward, this, this is a great measure. One of the challenges, and this is going to make you sad, Ian, is a lot of the projects in Australia, particularly mega projects, do not resource load programs. Yeah. And the argument is, isn't because the contractors aren't doing it, because they definitely are. Any smart contractor who is working for profit would have a resource loaded, cost loaded program. It's not being requested by the client. So now you have a, a problem when you've got a skills shortage, because I think a lot of countries are having this um, skills gap in particular projects, major projects, transport, infrastructure, defense, et cetera. And we can't see one of the most important metrics which is around the critical chain method and dependencies and also how you measure finite or um, I guess specialized resources. Um, and they tend to be, I guess, at a point of constraint where it could be things like if it's rail, it's test and commissioning. Um, if it's construction, there's always someone missing a role or a type of discipline. Um, so we do see this challenge across the board, but it isn't well known as you said. So my final thought for you and maybe then to hand off to Dale for finishing the pod is, what can we do about that? How do we raise the awareness for, for critical chain? Um, or we can just chat whenever we get the opportunity. And and different things will turn different people on. Mm. Yeah, that, that I found it very ironic that the PMI's project of the year in 2019 was the $4 billion development of a new aeroplane by Embraer which is a big project, getting an aeroplane approved and onto the market. It's not construction as such, but it's a, a big mega project, uh, which, which they completed in about 65% of the reference class. Yeah, if, you, if you'd use the reference class forecasting method, I heard you talking about it the other, uh, the other week, mm. uh, you know, Bent, Bent Flubeer's recommendation. If you'd use that, that would say that Embraer were crazy to plan five years. Because Boeing, Airbus, Mitsubishi, Bombardier, take eight. You're bonkers. No, mm. they delivered six weeks early. A $4 billion project. The, the PMI gave them the Global Project of the Year Award. Not thinking it was ironic that the PM Bock 6th edition removed critical chain because nobody around the table used it. Ouch. Uh, but <laughs> so the, to, to some people, it would be, how do people do those impossible projects well they use a, a an execution method and then but then you need to ignore the the academics who are saying execution doesn't matter you know if you if you take longer than planned it's because the plan was wrong ah rubbish if i run if if i plan to run a marathon in six hours and it takes me seven that's not because i've got the plan wrong it's because I've not prepared to run a marathon and I've got rubbish marathon running technique. Of course, I could make my estimate for running the marathon longer and hit it next time. But where's the fun in that? So, yeah, spreading the word. Uh, I know one of the one of the major um, yeah, Simon White BAE systems have picked up the learning that uh, that he had in Australia in maintenance. They've now got eight to 10 pilot projects all around the world piloting uh, critical chain and have been doing that pilot's been underway for 18 months now. Uh, so they're, uh, they're very supportive with the idea of, of getting it explicitly into professional body of knowledge. Uh, we on our master's program, methods like that are an integral part of uh, of, of what the sort of next generation project leaders are learning about but but in the world of projects it's a niche and not very well known mm. uh, any any ideas for spreading the words and i'd be gratefully received but if Absolutely. if anyone wants to find out a little bit about more about it with a genuine intent you know, get on google look around join the TOC ICO and watch some of the hundreds of presentations. Not very few of them are made by software providers. 
their companies that have said, we use this and we're making more money today. You know, look at, I, I did a, a mini experiment about four years, four or five years ago. I looked at the big software companies for scheduling and project control software. And I compared what the critical chain software companies clients were saying. They were saying things like 30% faster, 50% faster, you know, more projects with the same resource. Uh, yeah, th those were the sorts of things those clients were talking about. When I looked at uh, Oracle, Primavera, um, Microsoft projects, the clients were saying things like uh, one version of the truth. We've got all the data together. You know, we, ha we haven't got spreadsheets everywhere. Now, those are not good things, but they're not going to increase the share value of your company or add more social value to society. Mm. Uh, yeah. So, in, I mean, let's get the word out. It may not be optimum, but I think in a complex world, it seems to be a couple of steps in the right direction. Yeah, and and I think you know, I think the the, the biggest takeaway, and I think you said it a bit earlier, and is you know how we equip people with the right tools to apply for the right situation, and the more we know about what is out there the better positioned we are to apply it when uh, the time comes. Yeah. And, you know, just in your, your last couple of sentences there, I feel like you'll open a whole bunch of rabbit holes that we could go down, but um, we want to reserve some time for, for five. And I know you listen to the podcast, so I've, I've tried to select some that maybe you haven't um, heard before. So we like to keep this a bit of a surprise. So if you're ready for five, oh, we'll take your paces. <laughs> They're not difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so question one easy one what what would be your book recommendation your current book recommendation uh, if you like no novels critical chain uh, if you want to jump a little bit of it uh thriving at the edge of chaos by john sapier nice nice question two would you rather spend your day with people or data people what is the best advice you've been given uh Always put your boss in a position where he says you shouldn't have done that <laughs> rather than yes or no. Hello. Uh, yeah, you can see Val and I went, yep, great one. Uh, if you could start your career over again, would you do anything differently? Uh, no, from the point of view of the, the breadth of experiences I've had, no. If... If I could sort of suck up the experiences I had and go back, uh, I might stay running projects in the chemical industry a bit more, but only if I can get the experience <laughs> I learned after I left. So, so. Yeah, yeah, time machine, right? Yeah. Uh, and the last one, if if you could choose to be stuck in a lift with three people, who would they be? Hmm. Uh. Maybe my wife and nobody else, but uh, uh, if if that if if that's not an option and, and present company accepted, um, let's see. Yeah, back with Ellie Goldrat, God rest his soul. Um, somebody like Peter Kay to make me laugh, and. Uh, now you've thrown you've 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 thrown me on that one. I'll uh, I'll I'll stop at sixty seven percent success rate. <laughs> Fantastic. So, yeah, so we'll that get... you don't run out of storage space whilst I'm thinking. That's it. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Ian, look, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much. You know, for spending the best part of an hour with us. Like I say, two huge topics we try to put into one, and um, I thought you did extremely well to cover both of them in in one episode. Um, as you say, you know, an, an hour doesn't give enough time to do it to do them both justice and you know we'd love to have you back at some stage as well maybe for that debate around nec and we'll si see if we can line up glenn perhaps and uh have have that debate around what nec does or doesn't do um but yeah. yeah thank you so much for your time before we let you go any final thoughts that you'd like to leave our listeners with uh no but if you're in a position to give those two things a go give them a go otherwise find out about what makes them tick and see how much of those you can do 
within the constraints of the environment you work in. I think you'll find they make a big difference. Fantastic. Val, any final thoughts? No, thanks for having us. I mean, we, we feel like we've got the best seat in the house. And uh, every time we have a guest on like you, who's got so much knowledge, we would love to have you back. Um, but thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. It's been great fun. Thanks, Val. Cheers, Dale. Yeah, it absolutely has. And yeah, the, the, the pleasure and the privilege is all ours, Ian. So thank you very much. So there you have it, folks. The end of this episode. But remember, before you go, please do help us pay it forward by sharing a link to this episode on your favorite social media. Once again, a massive thank you to our guest, Mr. Ian Hipton Stoll. I got it right as well, Bill. And hey, well done. Listening. <laughs> and thank you all for listening. Till next time, we say stay safe, be disruptive, and have fun doing it. From me and Val, it's bye for now. Thank you.